Thanks for clicking into the THA podcast. We have a couple of things that we wanted to go over with our members that there's a, a big focus here in Austin at THA and uh, also around the state for our hospitals. One of them um, is the annual conference. The next one, of course, is the legislative session, which kicks off here in Austin in January. Um, to talk about a couple of the things that we do have going on, I have Anna Charnitsky. She's our publications director at THA. Um, so. Th- Thanks for uh, sitting in on the podcast. I know you're excited about it because you have to, but um, there's a lot of things that you've got uh, going on with the team. First of all, Texas Hospitals Magazine has hit newsstands uh, well, around the Christmas holiday, so I know that people are flipping through there, but we've got some good coverage in there. What's the first on, on your list there? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, every every end of the year, we try to preview our next THA board chair. Um, And so this issue, we are um, giving our members a little quick look at um, Sally Hurt Deitch, who is um, with Tenet Healthcare and, you know, an El Paso native. And so we, we look at, you know, kind of her, what what drives her, what type of leader she yeah, is. Yeah, that was an interesting profile. She's an outspoken leader um, and a, a nurse leader at that starting as she, as she started out. She really goes through her perspective um, that, that she's gotten uh, in the C-suite from her time as a, as a nurse nurse leader. So I think that, that was an interesting profile uh, that was covered and, and I think people will really enjoy uh, taking a look at it. She also has a unique view of what she thinks needs to be more of a priority in our political conversation. Yeah, that was a really interesting section. And I mean, it's something that we've we've heard kind of from some of our other, our other folks, but she really is looking at, you know, whether we're listening to each other, you know, we're trying to bring that kind of civility back into um, kind of that public discourse, so. Yeah, what I found interesting is that I think that she was also saying we don't necessarily need to that, that civility doesn't need to be absent of emotion or passion, that um, we can still go out there and advocate strongly um, with, with the, the level of, of passion, passionate zeal that we all kind of associate with being good advocates, but there does need to be a, a level of civility that um, we, we need to stop devolving um, to where it currently is. So I, and, and so I think she had an interesting point there. This will have a legislative session preview. Obviously, uh, legislative session is kicking off here in January, and there's a lot of things. We actually have in this podcast a, a guest uh, on the, for the program, uh, Evan Smith. He's a CEO of, of Texas Tri- Tribune, and that's a really a great legislative preview as well, what he talks about. But in our article, um, you know, it goes into a, a lot of, of great details. Yeah, and that really is, it's, it is a broad look, but it's specific to hospitals. So what are hospitals going to be paying attention to this legislative session? It really kind of goes, you know, deep dive into each of those separate issues, which yeah. you know, is not something that we always get in sort of the larger political debate. So Yeah, so go, going uh, d- deep into the, uh, the issues. Um, that I don't think anybody else can really get into. Um, we do kind of cover an area in there that I think is is largely looked over, but sometimes we'll get to some trade pubs, but trade publications, but some caregiver burnout and some of the tactics that are utilized by our hospital leaders to to address that. Yeah, that was a really good one. Um, you know, looking at just how hospitals are kind of taking a, a different, more holistic approach to it um, yeah. to to burnout, and it, you know, it's not just sort of a hey, you need to go take some time and go to a yoga retreat. No offense to right. yoga retreats, but right. you know that it, it really is, it's a more systemic issue. Yeah, I think that those issues have been taken more seriously than just the lip service that sometimes gets applied to employee satisfaction and other industries, um, because there's very clear cost associated with turnover in healthcare and turnover is so high that you can do some little key important things that are truly impactful to start to manage that burnout. And, and so there's lots in there for people to see. One of the things that is getting national attention that is covered in national media and more in the mainstream is the more frequent um, end to labor and delivery in our rural hospitals. We've had, especially in Texas, we've had a lot of, first of all, rural hospital closures. Um, but one of the things we've been making a point on for a while now is that you're not gonna see, the, the, the biggest thing that Texas are gonna see are not necessarily hospitals wholly closing, you're going to see like a retraction in service line by service line where you have narrower margins. And one of those big places we had always been talking about 
is something that we're seeing now, and that is closing labor and delivery for some of these hospitals. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty stark reality in a lot of places. I mean, and that's what the article really starts to go through of, you know, not just, yes, it's closing, but what were the reasons that it's closing? Um, and then also just, you know, there are a lot of stretches now in Texas where labor and delivery is quite a few miles away from a lot of Texas moms. And that's kind of a, that's a little bit of a scary trend happening here. Especially when, you know, they, we, we are, we're relying on hospitals when we need them as consumers. I mean, we, we don't think about them until we need them. And one of the biggest, one of the most frequent places where people associate their need with hospitals as, as, um, is, is labor and delivery. And, and so these moms that are out there in some of these rural areas and, um, is a big concern and it's, it's growing in bipartisan attention. And so it's not really falling into an area of Republican or Democrat concern. This is a real concern for everyone. And so it's really a great opportunity for our hospital members to get a feel for um, what our rural hospital needs are, especially with this as a um, with the labor and delivery uh, uh, through that microcosm so um, I think we got some good coverage there and we'll continue to cover additional angles on that I think the other thing we wanted to talk about is just recently launched the THA legislative app so yeah. where can people go to kind of get downloaded um, on, on, on that we are stepping up we are moving into this century and, and trying to give folks a little bit of, you know, an, another avenue to interact with THA and another avenue to kind of keep up with news and, and even take action, um, you know, make their voices heard as, as the legislative session gets um, underway. Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. You can go to, you know, if you're an Android user, you've got the Google Play Store. If you're an Apple user, um, it's right there on the App Store. Um, you just search for THA legislative session. Um, and you will see it. We've got the legislative session app. Good. Download it. You've got all kinds of good information in there. Yeah, I think it's um, you know you, you know with with apps you don't want to go too much and try to do try to do more than you really need to. So we really analyzed what our hospital leaders need, where they are wanting to be, where they are, and we want to make sure that this serves a specific set of needs. And, and we had collected a lot of information uh, that informed how we developed it. So uh, get more information on that at THA.org slash legislative uh, app. And, uh, and, and go from there. So it is time for interview with uh, Evan Smith. He's going to be sitting where you're sitting. And, and we had a great conversation. One of the things that's always interesting about him, no matter what, whether he's um, in, in doing a program for the Texas Tribune or doing, if you, even if you go back and look at the old reruns of his Texas Monthly Show on PBS and his, his show now, um, on 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 PBS is just his his zeal for the attention of the in the moment and his his focus on um, the details of uh, whether it's the political issue by issue by issue and then his knowledge of it is, is great but I like his his passion that gets uh, uh, that comes across in each of his conversations and it's certainly here in this podcast we definitely kept it it brief so that but nonetheless talking a little bit about what we have coming up uh, at the THA annual conference which again February 21st and 22nd here in Austin at the JW Marriott more information is available on that at THA.org slash conference so that was a great conversation and he'll be having um, he'll be moderating um, a panel I guess a, a panel with uh, Harold Cook and Brendan Stanhauser same panel that he moderated several years ago here in Austin, and so they'll be previewing not only the, the Texas agenda in healthcare and the larger political discussion, but then also um, uh, the, the federal level, which uh, so many uh, sides are on right now. So it's a good one. I think it's it's an exciting. It's a nice little. Uh, you know, so we are recording here the Friday before session kicks off. So I think it's a it's a great listen to you know not just to get a little preview of annual conference and, um, and that political debate there with Evan, moderated by him, Evan Smith, um, but also just get a little bit of his insight as, as session kicks off here in Texas. Yeah, absolutely. So with that, we're gonna kick it over to me and Evan. 
Evan Smith, thank you very much for joining us here on the THA podcast. We are excited to be able to talk to you and maybe flip the, the script a little bit and ask you some more questions sure. instead of you being the one that always asks questions. And one of the, you've got a great interview style and you get to, you host, uh, you, you moderate a forum every year at our annual conference and it's yeah. really a big draw. And, and part of the reason it's such a big draw is because you really do ask good questions, you do good interviews, but why do you, what do you think about uh, getting to do some of these questions to, to some of the political players and that has been so um, alluring for, for a lot of uh, our, our members? Because you've had some big names. Well, I think the, the, the first thing is you have people in the audience at this conference who have questions themselves that they'd like to ask these people. So the job of the moderator, my job at these conferences the last couple of years has been to put myself in the place of the people in the audience. What would they want to ask if they were up on stage instead of me? The, the moderator's job is ultimately an unselfish job. You have to put yourself in the mind of and carry the ball for a whole bunch of other people. Uh, these are critical topics to everybody in the room for work reasons, but we're also all Americans. We're Texans. And many of the issues that are being discussed at this conference are things that affect people back home where they live. They affect their lives, their lives of their families and friends and neighbors. So um, I, I think there are a whole bunch of different ways you can approach this. My approach is to simply try to ask the kinds of questions that I know people would want to ask. And of course, these days, um, when politics is so uh, controversial and contentious, the world is more divided than it's ever been, the political system is more divided, and there seems to be so much less of a chance of people coming together to solve big problems like what do you do about health, providing health care, lowering costs, or providing more access to more docks and more facilities. Those are harder problems than ever to solve today. So it's really important to get the insights of the kinds of people you've been able to bring to the conference. Yeah, and we've got, we've the last three years have been amazing uh, experiences because the people we are bringing in and the questions you bring to the table. Yeah. Last year was notable because we had Rove and, and Carville and that's always a circus in and of itself. Right. The year before that, you, we had Tucker Carlson and Eugene Robinson. That was interesting because we were in January of uh, President Trump's first term. So there was a lot of speculation right. and a lot of things for you to be able to, to go on. What do you think when we talk to Harold Cook and Brendan Stenhauser this year, we're going to really want to focus on because the, the, there are a lot of questions on the health care sure. front. Now. Well, I think there are two things. There's the federal component of this. We have a, a divided Congress now. As we sit here today, Nancy Pelosi literally within the last hour has been sworn in as Speaker of the House. Uh, Democrats now control the House. And the theory of the next two years is that unlike the first two years where the president could pretty much count on Congress doing exactly what he wanted, Congress is going to slow the president's and the administration's agenda to a, a crawl, if not an outright stop. You're not going to get any success if you're the president getting anything that you want passed through a Democrat-controlled House. You also have a presidential campaign that is starting up in earnest again as we sit here today with big candidates getting in one after another after another. And so everything that happens in the next Congress is going to play out against the backdrop of this uh, presidential campaign to come. And so no one is going to want to give the president anything. It, it, when he says um, this is all about 2020, in some respects he's right. That everybody uh, who, who in Congress who has got a design on, on the White House themselves is going to be acting with that uh, campaign in mind. So I think the federal piece of it is going to get a whole lot more complicated over the next two years. <clears throat> and anybody with insight into what this Congress and this president can and cannot do together on all of our behalfs, that person is going to be hugely valuable to hear from. And I would say that Brendan Steinhauser particularly, as somebody with <clears throat> a lot of experience working with Republican office holders at the federal level, members of Congress like Mike McCall or John Cornyn, um, working with some of the outside groups pushing against these guys in Congress to, to, to pass certain legislation or to prevent certain legislation being passed, he will be a particularly valuable person to hear from because he's going to understand what this environment uh, looks like. Now, the second part of this is at the state level, you've had unusually uh, momentous or atypically momentous elections. Here in Texas, we're used to election time being kind of definition of insanity territory. We do the same thing over and over. We predict a different outcome at the beginning of a session. The reality is that the math in our legislature and the math Republicans versus Democrats at the statewide level very rarely changes. And so every session looks very much like the last session and the session before that. Two things happened in this election cycle that were significant. One is that the statewide races were as close as they have been in decades. The voters delivered a message to the statewide elected leaders, take all the sharp objects off the table, stop focusing on things that we don't actually care about, do education, do healthcare, do infrastructure, and then get out of town. Don't call special sessions 
for no reason. So I think this is going to be a much more meat and potatoes session as a consequence of the, of the message delivered by voters. That's going to be really interesting. But I think at the legislative level, not at the statewide level, you also saw a narrowing of the partisan split in the House and the Senate. You went from 95-55 in the House Republicans, Democrats to 83-67. You went from 21-10 in the Senate Republicans, Democrats to 19-12. The Republicans' margin in each body is so narrow now that they almost have to work across the aisle with Democrats. And Democrats who've had no power for a very long time to either do anything on their own or prevent anything on their own, all of a sudden now have the power to actually uh, uh, take meaningful steps uh, uh, in the direction that their supporters want them to. And Harold Cook is one of those uh, uh, still very knowledgeable Democratic consultants, Democratic whisperers, know the people in, in those offices, has worked with a lot of the people in Democratic leadership in the House and the Senate. And so honestly, if you want someone to help you understand and navigate those waters in which Democrats are going to play a larger role, you could not ask for somebody better than Harold. So to have Brandon Steinhauser on the one hand, who understands the Republican mindset in Washington, and Harold Cook on the other, who understands the Democratic mindset in Austin, that, that ought to be a terrific conversation and very meaningful for you. Know, I, I think that's a good way to put it. And it, how important though, it is a, a health care win for Republicans in the state of Texas? You have G Governor Abbott, who was right. covered in the Dallas Morning News a couple weeks ago, talking just basically, and to your point, some of that dogma may not exist anymore. They actually use the word expansion. And some of our messaging and polling, yeah. if you use that word at all, you're, you're cooked. You're dead. You know, I, I actually have a real wonder. I, I wonder, let me say it this way, I wonder pretty uh, 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 significantly about whether health care is going to come onto the radar screen of this legislature this time. If you listen to the incoming speaker, Dennis Bonin, you listen to the Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick and to Governor Greg Abbott, what you hear is public education and property taxes, two issues that are separate but related. You can't fix one without fixing the other, or that's at least the theory. Um, education has for years and years been the number one line item in the all funds budget of the state of Texas that covers two years past during the legislative session, kicks in on September 1st after the session is over. But the, the, the line item these days that is growing the most quickly and is on the verge of passing education, if not outright passing education as we sit here, is health care. If education is such an important priority and nobody disputes it is, why are we not talking about health care the same way that we're talking about education? I have that question, absolutely. Every time I run into legislators, well, how come that's not on the top of your, of your list? We're spending so much money on health care. Health care costs are going up so much. We continue to have this persistent problem of not enough access to coverage. We still have the most people without health insurance in the entire country of any state. But we also have this ancillary problem of not enough doctors. We have a doctor shortage. Half the counties in the state of Texas are health professional shortage areas. We see rural hospitals closing. So you have parts of the state where people don't have access to facilities to the degree that they would need or would want. I mean, it's a pretty complicated landscape. But th that, that complicated landscape is exactly why the Texas Tribune exists. We can talk about that for a second. Right. Do you think to a large degree, and this is kind of one of the things I rant about, yeah. having been in the news business also, is that, uh, not, not to your level, obviously, but do you think that that is so uh, outside the binary conversation we have in healthcare on the large landscape that people can't dig into it. You guys are obviously publishing yeah. news that are, is, is into that level. I think, the, I think the reason that people don't talk about healthcare is to a, same, to, to, to a degree the same reason that people have a hard time talking about education except at the most basic level. It is a very complicated right. problem. It is very hard to unpack and repack. It is very hard to come up with a solution. So you have a small population of legislators who can actually speak to right. that. Right, and you know the legislature has a lot of medical professionals in it, doctors, nurses, and, uh, and you know, and, and folks who have experience with these issues. You know, it's a part-time legislature. These guys all have jobs, and exactly. these women all have jobs outside of what they do in Austin, and a lot of them happen to work in healthcare, and so or a large number of them, in any case. And so you have people who think they understand these issues. The fact is, this is an issue that affects every single person in the state of Texas. 28 million people, we're going to go to 55 million by 2050. We cannot continue the way we've been going. The cost structure is not sustainable. And I think that those are going to be, you're exactly right, and we could, we could definitely get into yeah. that a, a thousand and more we, times. And, we, and, we, and I will, I certainly yeah. intend to talk to Harold and to Brendan about Healthcare is a political issue. I mean, look, what, what did, go back to the federal part of this. What is Nancy Pelosi going to do as Speaker and the Democrats and the majority now going to do almost immediately is they're going to pass legislation to ensure that pre-existing conditions continue to be covered regardless of what people attempt to do to the, to the Obamacare uh, or the Affordable Care Act structure. Um, 
pre-existing conditions was a persistent through line in the narrative of the 28 election campaign. And People are talking about it. And it's much easier to follow than some of the other more complicated sure. aspects that hospitals have been extremely responsive to and changing operations by, far and wide from re adjusting readmissions, changing practices in the way that nurses so are we're gonna we'll have a lot to talk about on that day i think it'll be a mix of policy and politics right well we look forward to it and we're yeah. we're really happy to have you here to talk on the podcast but more excited to have you at the annual conference once again that's always a big well, draw a like great i said one. thanks, right, thanks a lot